The Old Myers Place, Chapter 3 The next morning, Mary pulled her red convertible into the school parking lot. She always arrived early to get a decent parking space. She turned off the ignition and sat there for a while, eating a blueberry muffin she picked up at Greta's Bakery. It was really cold outside today, and she wasn't looking forward to the walk down to campus. I bet it's 75 degrees in Los Angeles, she mumbled, suddenly longing for the perfect Southern Californian weather she was accustomed to. Mary was startled by a horn that blared from behind. In her rearview mirror, she caught a glimpse of Shannon's black BMW. The black car swung into a parking space a few yards away. Shannon was wearing a chocolate-colored wool coat and a matching pair of fur-lined gloves. She tapped on Mary's window. Hey, girlfriend, are you going to sit there, or what? she asked. Mary smiled and got out of the car. She snuggled into her tan suede jacket and locked her car. Hi, Shannon, what's happening? she asked. I should be asking you what's happening, Shannon said distantly. So, what's the deal? she asked. Her heated words hung in the chilly air. Uh Uh-oh, Mary thought. Something's up. Shannon always asked vague questions when she was upset. Can you be a little more specific? Mary asked unknowingly. What exactly do you want to know? Shannon stopped walking and pulled Mary in between two parked cars. She looked around to make sure no one was listening, then whispered, I heard that you were hanging out with the freaks yesterday after lunch. The way she said the word freaks with such disgust and conviction frightened Mary a little. She laughed nervously, figuring the two cheerleaders who passed by when she was talking to Julifer had said something. Oh? Mary responded. Shannon was dead silent, searching Mary's face for a more elaborate explanation. Mary wanted to tell her off right there for being so shallow, but changed her mind. She feared being all alone in the new school. She thought fast and let out a light laugh. Oh, that? she explained. I was just doing a little search for my psychology class, you know. I decided to interview my cousin and her friend for my midterm project. Shannon's expression suddenly became friendly and she began howling with laughter. What a great idea! That's so funny, she said. Mary forced herself to smile back but felt like a real phony. Michelle, the green-haired punk, had been right. Her harsh words echoed in Mary's mind. You're a sellout. Mary followed Shannon down the path toward school and listened to her lecture about social status and how people like themselves should never socialize with losers, freaks, punks, and geeks. The landscaping was covered in frost. Mary shivered. Thanks for the pointers, Shannon. I'll be sure to wear a sign on my back that says, Media, next time I talk to them. Shannon's expression was puzzled for a moment, and then she gave Mary a soft slug on the arm. Media! You crack me up. I'll see you later. Mary stopped at her locker to get books for the next few classes. She was thinking about Shannon, and how fragile their friendship really was, if you could even call it a friendship. Shannon had real money and a sort of blue-blood, inbred snobbiness. She had told Mary all about her debutante coming out party on her 16th birthday. Mary had thought that things like that only existed in the movies, but as it turned out, Tanya had been given one too. Mary's thoughts were interrupted by Josh Pender, who suddenly appeared by her side. He wore an expensive ivory sweater that contrasted fabulously against the gold tones in his hair and skin. He was smiling at her. Josh pushed her locker door shut to get her full attention. Mary remembered Jeff's warning. Josh was dangerous. In fact, Kimmy and Shannon had also told her to be careful around him, she thought. But Josh certainly didn't look dangerous right now. In fact, he looked as safe and as cuddly as her favorite teddy bear. Hi, Mary, he said confidently. His breath smelled like crisp peppermint. Mary felt her cheeks burning and wished she had been a little more prepared for this surprise meeting. Hi, Josh. How's it going? The bell rang. Josh glanced at the large clock in the hallway. Fine, he answered. Do you want to go get some uh, chow with me tonight? I thought you'd like to go down to Rose's diner. Yeah, that sounds like fun, she gushed, wishing that she'd responded a little less enthusiastically. It's not like you've never been out on a date before, Mary silently scolded herself. 
Josh raked a hand through his perfectly styled hair. Great. I'll pick you up at seven, he asked. Mary nodded coolly. Okay. Let me give you my address. Josh rolled his eyes. I know where you live. The old Myers place. In fact, everyone in town knows where you live. Your house is practically a historical landmark, he teased. Mary wished everyone would stop referring to her house as the old Myers place. Why couldn't they just forget about Michael Myers? About the boogeyman? It was her house now. But she guessed Josh hadn't meant to insult her. She smiled. Right. I'll see you later. See ya, Josh said with a wave as he ran down the hall. Mary made it to homeroom just as the final bell rang. She took her seat next to Tanya, who looked the other way when she saw her. It was just as well, Mary thought, after the way Tanya had insulted her yesterday. Suddenly, Tanya tapped Mary on her shoulder. I'm really sorry about what I said yesterday, she apologized. I was way out of line. Mary turned to look at Tanya, not believing that she lowered herself to say she was sorry. Tanya's burgundy wool sweater matched her cranberry-stained lips, which had curled into a little smile. Mary smiled back, wondering why Tanya was suddenly being so nice. No problem, she said. Great, Tanya said. I just hate for us to be enemies over such a stupid little incident. She batted her eyelashes. So everything's cool then? she asked. What did she want? wondered Mary. A formal apology acceptance? Yeah, everything's fine. I'm so glad you said that, Tanya told her. A spark of mischief flashed in her eyes. I guess I won't have to blackmail you after all. Silent alarm bells went off in Mary's head. Was she joking? Did she know something about Mary's less-than-perfect past? Mary remembered that her cousin Julifer knew everything about her past, through the family grapevine. But she didn't think that Julifer held it against her. Or did she? And if she did, had she opened her big mouth? Mary steadied, steadied her expression so that she wouldn't reveal the panic that had invaded her brain. Blackmail? You're kidding, right? Mary didn't like the evil glimmer that seemed to lurk deep within Tanya's eyes as she smiled mysteriously and said, What are you worried about? Has Mary, Mary, quite contrary, got something to hide? The stony expression on Tanya's face gave away nothing. What if she knows? Her new life could be instantly ruined by Tanya's loose lips. What if she'd found out about the arrest, or if she'd somehow seen a picture of Mary's former punk get-up? they never understand. Even though she'd left her old life behind and was a completely clean, new person, the straight-laced kids out here would never be able to comprehend what she had been through. Tanya was still wearing a knowing little smile. Mary was about to explain how she'd been at the wrong place at the wrong time when the drug bust went down, how her boyfriend back in L.A. had been a drug addict, how he'd sold some speed to an undercover narcotics agent that night when they'd left the nightclub. How Mary had been arrested on suspicion of dealing drugs herself. How she spent that horrible night in jail. Tanya waved her ring-covered fingers before Mary's blank face. Mary remembered how ashamed her parents had been of her. How she'd given up the punk scene for good after the experience. Tanya whispered, Hello? Anyone home? Mary? I was just kidding. Are you okay? Mary snapped back into present time. Yeah? She nervously twisted the fringe on her suede jacket and forced herself to smile. I'm fine. I was just thinking about my algebra class. I hope I did well on my test yesterday. She bluffed. Tanya twisted one of her jeweled rings. Don't you think you're being a little too serious, Mary? It's only math. For a minute there, I thought you were going to admit that you used to be an axe murderer or a dope dealer. She snickered. Mary crinkled her nose. Yeah, right. Chapter 4 Mary brushed her hair with long strokes in front of the mirror of her white wicker vanity. Josh would be here in 15 minutes and she wasn't even dressed yet. Mary had been to Rose's Diner lots of times since she'd moved to Haddonfield. All the local kids hung out there at night eating their to-die-for burgers and playing pool. But she'd never gone there on a date. Mary was pretty certain that she'd run into a lots of people from school tonight who would be watching her with scrutinous eyes. After all, everyone seemed to keep up with Josh's love affairs, 
as if he were the star of his own soap opera. Mary selected a comfortable pair of faded jeans and a green sweater from her dresser drawer. The emerald-colored sweater always made her eyes stand out like rare jewels. She wanted to look good tonight, but not too dressed up, as if she'd made a big effort. Mary stepped into her closet and dug out a pair of black leather boots. An icy draft breathed through the decaying old floorboards. Mary shivered, remembering that she still had to go down there to look for her lost bracelet. Luckily, her parents hadn't noticed that it was missing, yet. She quickly laced up her boots and closed the closet door. A horn honked outside. Mary peeked through the lacy curtains of her bedroom window and saw Josh sitting in the driver's seat of his black Porsche. The exhaust from the sleek sports car formed a cloud in the chilly evening air. She could hear a loud blast of music coming from his ultra-expensive stereo system. Mary's heart thudded with excitement as he revved the engine. Her noble escort had arrived. Mary maintained a cool, collected composure as she crossed the frost-covered lawn. Josh stepped out and opened the passenger door for her, looking as if he could have been a young TV star. My lady, he bowed majestically. Mary giggled at his exaggerated gesture of gentlemanliness. Thank you, sir, she giggled. Then she sank into the butter-soft leather seat and stole a glimpse at Josh. He really does look like Brad Pitt, Mary thought. Josh flashed Mary a crooked grin and punched the accelerator. The car responded, blasting off with rocket force. Mary sat back and enjoyed the fast ride. She watched Josh's hands deftly shift gears and maneuver the steering wheel as they wove down the winding roads towards town. Mary ran her hand across the black dashboard. Nice car, she said over the loud rock music. Nice everything, she thought. Josh just nodded casually. He was rich, very rich. His father owned a large chemical plant that supplied all of the major cosmetics companies with their raw materials. She wondered if her shampoo had been made with products from Pender Industries. Josh smiled. Thanks. My dad bought it for me for getting good grades. He's hell-bent on shipping me off to Harvard so I can get a master's degree in business and take over the company at some point, he said mockingly. Mary asked, Is that what you want to do with your life? Why not? He responded. It's all set up and I'll be set for life. Yeah, I'm going to own it all someday. Mary nodded her head. It must be nice to have your whole life planned out for you. To never have to worry about your future, she thought enviously. Josh said, So, what do you want to do with your life, Mary? Mary had thought about that question many times and still didn't have any idea. Like, I don't know yet. I haven't figured it out. The Porsche blew past the tree-covered forest. The lights of downtown Haddonfield twinkled over the horizon. Josh turned down the stereo and looked intently at Mary. So why'd you decide to go out with me? he asked. The question caught Mary off guard. She swallowed hard, not quite sure how to answer. What? She asked, stalling. Josh repeated himself. Why are you here with me? I mean, what makes you want to go out with a guy like me? Mary wrinkled her brow, wondering what he was getting at. Are you fishing for compliments? She asked. Josh leaned back in his seat and slowed the car a little. No, I just like to know what you're thinking. You know, what turns you on? What makes you tick? Mary shrugged her shoulders, figuring an honest answer would be best. Like, I guess I just wanted to get to know you a little better. I mean, we've been friends for a while, but I don't really know you. She cleverly reversed the uncomfortable subject. Why did you ask me out? She asked, glumly remembering Tanya's comment about her bad reputation. Josh smiled confidently. Because you're pretty, and you're funny. You're about the only girl at school with a personality, he added. And you're mysterious. You're the new girl, from L.A., who lives in the old Myers place? The whole package is so intriguing. I want to unwrap you like I'd tear open a giant box on my birthday. Mary choked. Excuse me? Josh corrected himself. I mean, I want to know more about you, he explained. Around here, everyone knows everything about everybody. But you? You come from another world. I want to know everything about you, what you've done, where you've been, and what you've seen. Mary joked. Well, 
I never unwrap on my first date. Josh swung the car into a parking space at Rose's Diner. The red neon sign cast a pink glow on his handsome face. He leaned across the seat. Can I at least untie the ribbon? he asked. Before she could think, Mary felt her head nodding yes. Josh's soft lips pressed against hers. She closed her eyes, savoring the brief, delicious moment. Josh pulled away and smiled. That was just a peek at the gift tag, and I liked what it said. Yeah, Mary admitted. Me too. Josh held Mary's hand loosely and led her into the packed diner. The red vinyl booths were crowded with kids. Everyone was talking and laughing over the loud music that blared down from several television screens turned to MTV. Someone might as well have pulled the power plugs to the couple walked across the room. Everyone stopped talking for an uncomfortable moment, sizing up Josh's date. Josh slid into a small corner table and Mary followed. No one was staring anymore, but Mary could feel occasional glances and hear muffled whispers. Over the noise, she heard someone at the next table ask, Is that Josh's new girlfriend? Mary turned around to see who it was, but saw only a table full of girls she didn't know, smiling back at her. The small town stuff is pretty weird, she thought. If we were in L.A. right now, no one would even give us a second look. We'd just be lost in a sea of faces. Mary picked up a menu and hid behind the laminated list of greasy selections. She'd never felt so awkward in her entire life. Josh peeled off his leather jacket and yelled over the music. I guess this wasn't such a great place for a first date. Let's eat and get out of here. Mary was relieved. Okay, she agreed. Josh ordered two burger specials and two sodas. Mary hoped that the service would be fast tonight. Mary turned to see Shannon and Kimmy enter the diner. They stopped at the pool table to flirt with a group of football players. Mary was actually happy that they were there, even though she knew they'd most likely come to spy on Josh and her. She stood up and waved until Kimmy saw her. Do you girls always travel in packs? Josh asked, a little annoyed. Like, only when there are wolves around, Mary joked. Josh's irritated tone melted and he smiled wickedly. Oh, he howled. He stood up and took an animated little bow as almost every girl in the room giggled. Mary blushed as she realized that every eyeball in the place was watching them again. She quickly got up and sat down next to Josh to make room for Shannon and Kimmy, who were laughing as they approached the table. Shannon's mint green pants and shirt clashed trendily with her purple nail polish. She dropped her clear plastic purse on the table. Hey guys, are we interrupting anything? I thought I heard the call of the wild over here, she said. Kimmy jokingly yanked on Shannon's hair, which was tied back in immature little ponytails. Shannon, she scolded. Can't you ever be quiet for five minutes straight? Shannon sat down and replied, Communication makes the world go round. Like, then that must make you Earth's main power source, Mary said with a laugh. Ha ha, very funny, Shannon said, snickering. She turned to Josh. We just invited a few guys on the football team to your Halloween bash. You don't mind, right? No, that's cool, Josh told her. He glanced around the room. Just be careful not to spread the word to any losers or freshmen. Got it? As if we know any losers, Kimmy exclaimed. Please! The food arrived at the table. Mary saw Kimmy enviously eyeing her fries. She nodded and Kimmy grabbed a greasy handful. Shannon pointed to the football players by the pool table and whispered, The jocks over there said that Mary should be a cheerleader. Wouldn't that just be a riot? Mary challenged lightheartedly. Oh yeah? You think I couldn't do it? Yeah, right. I can just see you now, Mary, wearing a Haddonfield High sweater and pleated skirt up to your belly button, Shannon howled. Before she realized what she was doing, Mary stood up on the table, began to take an imaginary pair of pom-poms, and screamed, Two, four, six, eight, I'm the girl you love to hate. Zero, one, two, three, don't you wish that you were me? Yay, cheerleaders! Josh, Kimmy, and Shannon were doubled over with laughter, along with nearly everyone else in the diner. Shannon was nearly choking on her soda. You're such a geek, Mary, she snorted. 
Everyone was cracking up as Kimmy gave Mary a spirited high five. You go, girl! She yelled. Josh threw his head back in laughter. You have got nerve, Mary. He put his arm around her. Where'd you get your personality? The Barbizon School of Modeling? Where else? She joked. Josh nudged Mary. I think she'd be the hottest babe on the squad, he said. In fact, I might even join the football team if Mary was in a skimpy costume cheering for me. Mary took a bite of her juicy burger, a little embarrassed by Josh's compliment. Kimmy imitated a sports announcer. And here comes Josh Pender, number 19. He's going for the touchdown. But wait, what's going on? He's running toward the sidelines. He's dropped the ball and is chasing one of the cheerleaders. He's officially entered the football hall of shame. Josh laughed hard and looked at Mary who seemed to be having a great time. He pointed at a giant glob of ketchup that had dripped onto her sweater. Mary cursed. Shit! She grabbed a napkin and tried to wipe it off. Where's Tanya? Josh suddenly asked. Why is he thinking about Tanya? Mary wondered jealousy. This is supposed to be our date. She's out with Rob, Shannon said. Rob Wheeler was captain of the basketball team. Shannon then added, He's probably scored a three-pointer with her by now. The insult made Mary giggle as she dabbed water on the stain. But then she wondered if Shannon talked behind her back like that, too. Shannon had a strange way of discussing her friends when they weren't around. By the frown on Josh's face, Mary could tell that he wasn't amused by Shannon's wisecrack. Mary nudged Josh, who was picking the shredded lettuce off his burger. Hey, she said. Josh seemed lost in his thoughts. Hey, he mimicked, giving her a smile. The stain was not coming out of Mary's sweater. I'll be right back, you guys. I'm going to try to rinse off this spot with some hot water. Satisfied that the ketchup was out, Mary flipped her hair over the wet spot before exiting the bathroom. As she made her way across the restaurant toward the table, she suddenly froze in mid-step. The familiar music seemed to pump louder and louder. Her heart thumped along with the wild beat and screeching lyrics. It was the Electric Voodoo Skulls video. She looked at Josh, who was chatting with Shannon and Kimmy. Nearly everyone in the place was gawking at the screen and laughing. You couldn't help but stare at the screeching lead singer, who had a pasty white face and long black dreadlocks. Excitement was flashing in Josh's eyes. Let's get out of here, he suggested. Mary was more than ready to leave the diner and chill out somewhere. Let's go, she agreed. Shannon blew a little kiss at Mary and Josh. Have fun, you guys, she cooed. Don't do anything I wouldn't do. Josh smirked. You mean like wearing a pair of those green polyester duds you're in? No thanks. Shannon smiled smugly and gave him the finger. On their way out, Josh scooped Mary into his arms and carried her through the front door of the diner, which set off another wave of laughter inside. Josh set Mary on the ground by his Porsche and opened the passenger door. You are so cool, he stated. I may have met my match. Mary smiled, got in the car, and stared up at the gleaming moon through the tinted windows. You're pretty cool, too, she said. I'm glad we've shared this interesting night together. <laughs> Don't make it sound so formal, he laughed. That's what I like best about you. You're wild and crazy, just like me. Everyone else is so boring around here. She wondered what he meant by wild and crazy. Just how wild and crazy was he? How far would he go for a good laugh? You want to see my boat? He asked. It's docked on the lake. His boat? What would we do on his boat at this time of night? She wondered. Only one thought came to mind. Josh had this intense look in his eyes. Mary shook her head. I don't think so. Maybe some other time? Josh started the engine of his car. Oh, come on. I promise to behave like a perfect gentleman. He cocked his head to one side and looked as innocent as a puppy. I'm really into boats, and I want to show you mine. Mary laughed to herself, thinking that the boat probably wasn't the only thing he wanted to show her. But he did look pretty harmless, and he was such a babe. She decided that she could handle him if things started to get out of hand. Okay, she finally said with a sigh, but I've got to be home by nine. Chapter 5 The lake was still and quiet except for a few gentle ripples. 
the bright moonlight shone peacefully upon the black water. Several lonely-looking boats bobbed up and down. Josh pulled the car up to the dock, and the couple got out. Josh selected a golden key from the ring, twisted it in the lock of the iron security gate, and gestured for Mary to enter. He held the door for her and followed, letting the heavy door crash shut behind them. Josh squeezed her hand as he led her down the chunky wooden dock. Which one is it? Mary asked, looking out at the spectacular boats. Josh pointed to a large houseboat in the last slip. Over there. That's the SS Pender, he said proudly. I come here a lot. Sometimes I fish, but most of the time I just kick back. It's so quiet and isolated up here. Wow, she said breathlessly. It's, I mean, she's beautiful. Mary stepped aboard the impressively large boat. She breathed in the fresh, cool air and made a silent wish that things would work out between the two of them. It would be so fab to have a great-looking guy with his own boat, she thought. She fantasized about the two of them still together next summer, sunbathing on the deck. Mary stood on the deck, gazing out over the rail into the blackness of the lake. Tall pine trees and bending willows surrounded the water's every edge. Tiny lights from the lakeside houses twinkled and glowed magically in the reflection of the water. Josh disappeared into the cabin below and flipped on a few lights. Come on down, he called. Mary grabbed the handrail and followed the steps. Josh was looking for something in the cabinets. Mary sat down on the freshly upholstered bench and looked around at the cute maritime decor. Everything was done in matching blue and white. Would you like some hot tea? he asked as he pulled a couple of mugs from a shelf. I'd love some, Mary answered. I just love hot tea. I drink about four cups a day, except for today. I think I only had one cup with my toast this morning. Stop babbling, Mary, she scolded herself. Just chill out. Josh filled a couple of ceramic mugs with water and popped them in the miniature microwave oven. Well, I'm glad to know that you're an avid tea drinker, he said. Mary blushed, feeling like an awkward geek sitting there with nothing to say. Josh sat down across from her and stretched his long legs across the bench. He always seemed to be totally at ease, she thought. She guessed that anyone who was as rich as him, and as popular and handsome, would feel pretty confident. Mary noticed how huge his feet were for the first time. So, how's it been living in the old Myers place, he asked her. Mary shrugged. Okay, I guess. She smiled thinly. But I don't understand why everyone is so fascinated with the place. I mean, it's just a house. It's not just a house in this town, Josh said. Most people around here are terrified to even look at it. I mean, it's the place where it all started. Where the boogeyman was spawned. Where Michael Myers massacred his sister. Don't remind me, Mary said dryly. I've been told that my room was where Michael killed his sister. Josh raised his eyebrows and made a face. Wow, that's pretty heavy. He got up to take the tea out of the microwave. Has anything weird happened yet? Yet? Mary repeated. Josh kept talking as he dipped the tea bags in the water. You know, like ghosts appearing or unexplained noises or anything? I mean, they do say it's haunted. Mary took off her jacket and sighed. At least we're talking about something that interests him, she thought. No, nothing's happened. It's a perfectly normal house as far as I'm concerned. Josh handed Mary a mug of steaming tea. Well, they say that after he escaped from the loony bin, he came home before he went on his Halloween massacre. The one where he murdered 12 kids with a butcher knife? I think that was back in 1985 or something. The police filled him with enough lead to kill an entire city. And I'm sure you know about how he came back last Halloween and burned City Hall to the ground, then murdered the mayor, a couple of cops, and four kids at the big Halloween party. The Scream Factory? They could never prove that it was actually Michael Myers because they never found his body. But everyone who was there will swear that it was him. Not some copycat killer. You know, he's still missing. So I've heard... Are you trying to freak me out or something? Mary yawned. Josh reseated himself and laughed. I'm sorry. You probably don't want to hear all this stuff, especially now. 
just a few days before Halloween and all. Thanks for the reminder, she said. Let's talk about something else, okay? You've got it, Josh said. How about some music and a game of Chinese checkers? Mary was pleasantly surprised by a suggestion. Great, but I'd better warn you, I play a mean game. I hope you're not one of those guys who always has to win, she joked. Ha! Josh said with a snort. That sounds like a challenge. He flipped on the built-in stereo and tuned the radio to the local rock station. Then he set up the checkerboard and teased. By the way, I am one of those guys. But we don't have to worry about you winning because I'm going to kick your ass. Like, yeah, right, Mary laughed. Outside in the black shadows of the whispering willows, a dark shape crouched by the edge of the water, watching the boat. A low, menacing growl escaped from his lips. He watched the teenagers through the tiny porthole window as they laughed and talked. The shape disappeared into the darkness. Mary stood up and did a little victory dance to the beat of the song on the radio. Ha ha! I won! She sang. She was feeling totally relaxed and comfortable now that they'd broken the ice. Josh threw his hands up in the air. What can I say? You got a lucky break. Let's play best two out of three. Mary was having a wonderful time, but she'd already told him that she had to be home by nine, and it was ten to now. She felt that it was important to set and stick to limits with guys like Josh, who were used to being swooned over. Even though she really wanted to say, she knew that playing hard to get would attract him even more. Sorry, she told him. I've got to go home now. Come on, he pleaded. Just one more game. Nope she said firmly, slipping into her coat. I can't stay. She watched his disappointed reaction and knew that her scheme was working. Josh smiled and flipped off the stereo. He didn't want to look like a needy, uncool geek on their first date. Okay, you win, he corrected himself. I mean, you win as in you get to go home. We'll settle the score with the game next time. It's still best two out of three, got it? Josh drove a lot slower taking her home than he'd picked her up. He didn't want the night to be over so early, but reminded himself that he'd see her tomorrow at school. Mary really turned him on, just as he knew she would. Josh pulled up in Mary's driveway next to her red convertible. I'll see you tomorrow at school, he asked. He instantly felt stupid and tongue-tied for asking such an idiotic question. Of course you'll see her at school, dummy, he thought. Mary's bright eyes sparkled. Yeah, I'll see you tomorrow. Josh scrambled to open the passenger door for her. I really had a good time tonight, he admitted. Me too, she whispered. She glanced at her dark house. Looks like the rents are still out, she said. Your parents aren't home? You want me to come inside, he asked. Up uh, to make sure no one's hiding in there? Mary shook her head. Nah, I'll be fine. But you can walk me to the door if you want, she offered. Josh held out his arm and walked her up to the porch. Without asking, he planted a kiss on her lips. A warm tingle traveled down her back, and she allowed herself to enjoy the moment briefly as she kissed him back. Mary gently pushed him away, although she really didn't want to. Play hard to get, Mary, she reminded herself. She opened her front door while Josh stood there feeling totally baffled. He was used to getting his way with girls. All the girls. He was Josh Pender, he reminded himself. He was irresistible to the female species. Mary blew him a little kiss. Good night, she said. As she went to close the door, Josh jammed his foot in the doorway to stop it. He was not ready for this date to end yet. He quickly turned on the charm and gave Mary his best smile, the one he practiced every night in the mirror. Are you sure you don't want me to come inside? Just for a little bit? he asked in his velvety smooth voice. A little taken aback by his bold advance, Mary politely said, No, Josh, my parents will be home any minute. Besides, tomorrow's a school day, and I really need to get to bed. Josh felt like a fool. He couldn't remember the last time a girl had turned him down. Stepping backward, he smiled sheepishly and said, Okay, see you, Mary. Inside the house, Mary leaned against the front door and listened to Josh's footsteps as they faded down the driveway. She had to hold back a squill of excitement. As soon as his car pulled away, 
she victoriously shouted. Yes! Chapter 6 Mary ran her hand along the oak railings as she floated up the staircase. Her date with Josh had gone better than she planned. He'd practically been drooling all over her out on the porch. Mary gave herself a mental pat on the back and flipped on the light in her bedroom. She flopped backward onto her soft bed and stared up at the crystal light on the ceiling. She closed her eyes and recreated the goodnight kiss in her head. Thoughts of the eventual evening tumbled through her mind. She still couldn't believe that she'd stood up on the table in the diner and that her little cheerleader impersonation had been such a big hit with the conservative teenage population of Haddonfield. A new wave of confidence and self-esteem washed over her. Maybe life wasn't going to be so bad here after all, she thought. Maybe they'd even nominate her as the prom queen later this year. She imagined herself stepping out onto the auditorium stage and taking the crown. Josh would be the king, and together, they'd be the envy of the entire school. A dark shape emerged from the woods and darted across the street towards the house. His hot breath hung in the freezing night air as he squatted down, his face hidden in the shadows of the tool shed. His hateful eyes greedily watched the sexy red-headed girl through her bedroom window, blazing about on her bed as if she didn't have a care in the world. A vicious growl escaped from his lips. A rush of adrenaline pumped through his body as his feet led him around the back of her house. He violently slashed away a thick mass of ivy that clung against the metal power box. With a crude, rusted axe in his filthy hand, he hacked the ribbons of wire loose from their deeply rooted nesting inside the box. The power groaned off and the house went dark. The shape silently moved up the steps of the back porch and began tugging on the flimsy screen door. Mary sat up in her bed and shrieked when the electricity suddenly snapped off. She forced herself to stay calm as she groped around for one of her aromatherapy candles. She squinted in the darkness and found a book of matches in her bedside dresser. The tiny orange flame let off a puff of sulfur as she touched it to the wick of an evergreen-scented candle. Mary cupped the candle in her hands. The flickering light shone eerily around the room. Suddenly, her heart thudded heavily as she heard a rattling at the back door. Oh, God, no, she whispered. Her voice quivered. Mom? Dad? Is that you? Mary panicked. Of course it's not my parents. They would have used the front door. She silently moved across her room and picked up the phone receiver. A pang of terror shot through her brain as she discovered that the line was dead. Oh God, I've got to get out of here. The light rattling against the back door swiftly turned into desperate, maniacal pounding. But the loud, forceful thuds were drowned out by the dreadful sound of her furiously pumping heart. Is the deadbolt locked? I can't remember. Suddenly, the door downstairs crashed open with jarring force. Mary jumped backward and sucked in her breath. Help me! Somebody help me! Heavy footsteps clunked across the hardwood floor and moved swiftly up the stairs. Before Mary could blow out the candle and hide, she heard her bedroom doorknob rattling. No! No! She screamed. She hurled her body against the door and racked her brain for some way to escape the nightmarish situation. Her eyes darted around in the pitch black darkness, searching for something, anything to use as a weapon. Mary shrieked and watched in horrified fascination as the weight on the other side of the door buckled the wood inward. With a splitting noise, the lock popped and the door crashed wide open. In a flash, she dove toward the corner of the room and watched in horror as the huge shape shrouded in darkness appeared in the doorway of her bedroom. Her eyes wide with terror, Mary ran to her bedroom window screaming. Panic welled up inside as the intruder lurched toward her. She tried to force open the window, but it was sealed shut with paint. Mary opened her mouth to scream again and was instantly cut off by a rough, filthy hand that clamped tightly over her mouth from behind. Numb with terror, Mary struggled and tried desperately to wriggle free from the intruder's grip. He was really hurting her, and she knew that he wanted her dead. Mary's legs crumbled beneath his crushing weight. His hands clasped around her neck, his fingers digging deeply into her flesh. Mary gasped for air. Fight back, she told herself. With a desperate surge of adrenaline, Mary elbowed the intruder as hard as she could in the ribs. Surprised by her strength, the shape slammed backwards against the wall and fell to the floor. 
Wild footsteps mixed with the sounds of heavy breathing and panting filled the room. A blur of black shadows and misshapen figures danced around the room in the eerie flicker of the one tiny candle. Something metallic clattered to the floor. In the darkness, the intruder lunged toward her from the right, then the left. He seemed to be everywhere. In an instant, she found herself on the floor, free for a moment from the clutch of her attacker. Run, run, she willed herself. Mary stumbled down the stairs, screaming in a wild panic. From the darkness upstairs, a voice rasped out. Mary! Mary burst out the front door into the freezing air and tore down the street. Help! Somebody help me! She screamed. Mrs. Smith, an elderly woman who lived down the road, stood on her porch and called out to Mary. Mary, what's wrong? What happened? Mary wailed. Call 911! There's someone in my house! Mrs. Smith quickly ushered the terrified girl into her living room and bolted the door, then went into the kitchen and dialed the police. Mary peeked out from behind the sheer white curtains down the street at her dark house. She tried to catch her breath and flopped down on the worn green sofa. She didn't remember seeing anyone follow her outside, a fact that didn't make her feel any better. But who? Why? she asked herself. Mary nearly jumped out of her skin when Mrs. Smith walked back in the room carrying a plate of cookies. Don't worry, honey, the woman assured her. The police are on their way. You're safe here. Mary waved away the plate of sweets. She felt too sick to even thinking about drinking a glass of water, let alone eat a cookie. Mrs. Smith lifted the shade on the lamp to shine some more light on the girl. My God, your face and neck are all scratched and swollen, she said. Mary's eyes filled with tears. He tried to kill me, she moaned. He, he, he was in my house, in my bedroom, and he, he. Mrs. Smith put a gentle arm around Mary's shoulder. Shh, just relax, honey, shh. Mary broke into a fit of uncontrollable sobbing. Moments later, police sirens filled the air. A deputy officer entered Mrs. Smith's home to question Mary. The young police rookie filled out a police report form as Mary described the attack in as much detail as she could remember. It all happened so fast, she said, and it was pitch black in there. I couldn't see his face. Mary controlled her hysteria as she answered the questions. Then an ambulance pulled up outside. I don't need an ambulance, she cried. Really, I'm okay. Just a few scratches. The rookie's radio crackled on. A scratchy voice reported. We've got a suspect at the victim's home. He's unconscious. Can you bring the girl over to identify him? Mary's hands began shaking. He, he's still in there? She asked, feeling totally bewildered. The rookie gave Mary a reassuring smile. You must have given him quite a whack in the head, he commented. Mary followed the deputy to her house, her eyes fixed on the bedroom window. Thin beams of light shone through the windows from the police flashlights inside. Blue and red police sirens pulsed across her lawn. I can't believe this is happening to me, she whispered. The old police chief met Mary and the young deputy on the front lawn. Mary what? he asked gruffly in her direction. Y yes she stammered. The chief pointed toward her house. We need you to come inside with us to identify the suspect. He's still knocked out cold, and the paramedics don't want to move him just yet. Can you do that for us? Mary went from feeling emotionless and empty to seething angry. Angry that someone would come into her bedroom to attack her, to try and kill her. Yes, she decided she would identify him and make goddamn sure that he was put away for a long, long time. Okay, she answered bravely. Mary followed the two policemen through her front doors. Emergency light lanterns were set up all around the house now, so the darkness wasn't as black and suffocating as it had been before. The chief explained as they went up the stairs. He cut the power. Totally ripped apart the box. We'll have the city fix it up later tonight. After we dusted your fingerprints. Mary nodded dumbly. They reached the top of the stairs and the officer stepped aside as Mary peeked into her bedroom. The blood drained from Mary's face when she saw who was lying on the floor. Oh no, it can't be, she said. She backed out into the hallway and banged her head against the wall in disbelief. 
The chief pointed through the doorway at the suspect, who was starting to come to. You know this guy? he asked. Mary took a deep breath. Like, that's my ex-boyfriend, Jeff Wayland. She quivered, feeling as if she were stuck in a bad dream. We'll need you to make a positive ID, Miss White. Is this the man who attacked you? The officer said routinely. Mary's head was spinning. It couldn't be. This can't be happening. But the welts on her neck were real. She peeked in at Jeff. He looked so peaceful like a sleeping child with his golden hair curled around his ears. She turned away in disgust. I I don't know, she stammered. It was too dark to see anything. I, I can't remember. Jeff Wayland rolled his throbbing head against the carpet and blinked his eyes open as if he were just waking on a lazy Sunday morning. Startled and confused, he tried to remember where he was and how he had gotten there. Suddenly, he jumped to his feet, surprised by all the unfamiliar faces. He stumbled backward, still dizzy from a painful blow to the head. The two officers rushed forward and grabbed the confused team. The deputy pulled out a pair of handcuffs and snapped Jeff's hands together behind his back. Whoa! Easy, son! In a flash, it all came back to him. He frantically looked around the room, oblivious to the serious trouble he was in. Mary, he cried. Where's Mary? Is she all right? D did you find him? The officer extracted his billy club just in case this teenager nut got out of hand. Take it easy, boy, he bellowed. You've got a lot of explaining to do. Jeff's eyes darted around the room, which had been turned upside down in the struggle, and he realized that he was being targeted as the attacker. Oh, oh no! he said, taking a step backward. It's not what you think. I was trying to save her from the guy who broke into the house, he explained. The officer laughed cynically. Oh, yeah? Well, where is he then, this robber friend of yours? Jeff looked down at the ripped sleeve of his sweatshirt. His explanation rushed out. I saw someone come inside and I followed him to make sure nothing bad happened to Mary. He must have hit me over the head and escaped, he pleaded. You've got to believe me, officer. I never hurt Mary. Never. Mary clamped her hands over her ears. She'd heard enough of this insanity. She began to sob and was led downstairs by a female paramedic. The officer poked his billy club at Jeff. Save it for later. You're coming down to the station with us. Yep, come on down, boy. We've got some questions for you. The chief added. Mary's parents pulled up in front of the house. They jumped out of the car, still dressed in their business suits. Mary's mom dropped her briefcase on the lawn and rushed over to the ambulance. My God, honey, what on earth happened? She cried. Mary began crying and gave her mother a tight hug. Someone, Jeff Wayland, I think, broke into the house and attacked me, she blubbered. Mary's mom sucked in her breath. Mr. White rushed to the back door of the ambulance where a paramedic was rubbing some disinfectant on Mary's scratches. Her father ran a shaky hand through his graying hair. Are you okay, honey? He asked. I'm fine, Daddy. I'm pretty shaken up, but I'm not really injured or anything. Mary answered, knowing she'd have to be strong to get through this. Her father pushed his glasses up from his nose and sighed heavily. I'm so sorry, honey. He clasped her hand in his. I'm so sorry this happened to you. The police officers led Jeff Wayland out of the house. His head was lowered in shame until he caught a glimpse of Mary, sitting in the back of the ambulance. He tried to lunge toward her, but was violently jerked back by his captors, and a crackling voice Jeff said, Mary, I didn't do it! You've got to believe me! I was trying to save you! Mary shrank back in fear. He's crazy. Completely and utterly crazy. And he just tried to hurt me. The horrible thought made her feel queasy. The officers pushed Jeff into the back of the squad car and drove away into the night. Okay, this has been chapters 3, 4, 5, and 6 of Halloween, the Old Myers Place by Kelly O'Rourke. And Michael is here. What did you guys think of Michael's first real scene, his attack and everything? And uh, you think Jeff will get out of this? You think he'll end up being the savior towards the end? Well, we're about 60 pages in of a 150-page book, and the plot thickens. Let me know what you guys think of all the characters so far. I happen to think Mr. Josh Pender is just a creep, and he's going to show his true colors soon. 
and I think that Jeff and uh, Mary will be the ones that end up together in the end. Unless Jeff bites the big one, which is still to be seen. Alright guys, I'll be back very soon with some more of Halloween the Old Myers Place. Until then, this has been your friendly neighborhood 80s slasher librarian saying, thanks for listening, and I'll see you next time. Also, please guys, if you, if you want to subscribe and haven't done so already, right above at the end of the video, click on Michael's pretty face there. Also, check out the audio book I've got up in the top right corner. One of my personal favorites I've done so far. And the left link up there is a fun Friday the 13th fan film made by the popular channel Slash and Cast. It's a really good fan film. You guys should really check it out. And after you're done, if you haven't done so already, subscribe to Slash and Cast. These guys are awesome. They cover all kinds of horror news, movies, video games, TV shows. The guys are awesome. Check them out, and I'll see you later.